There is a, uh, at the political level, there is definitely a bipartisan consensus that China is the enemy. Uh, so this will not change or be affected by any uh, U.S. political shifts because China has the effrontery to be successful and to be successful and independent of the United States. And this is not allowed in the game of risk. So China is clearly the enemy and it's clearly bipartisan. And the American people are fed a lot of um, hate rhetoric and two rhetorics. One, China took all your jobs and China's a threat to the world. So both of those are at play. And I would say Biden faces no obstacles on uh, China policy except being too soft. So he's constantly watching his back that he's not perceived as too soft. That's, of course, why he didn't stop Pelosi's trip, not because she was the co-equal part of government. Our Constitution assigns foreign policy explicitly to the president of the United States. He's also the commander in chief. This is not even a close call. Had he told her no, uh, again, maybe she could have flown uh, commercial, but she wasn't going to go. So he doesn't want to look soft. And that's the biggest danger in American politics, which is when you don't want to look soft, you end up in Vietnam or you end up uh, in countless uh, other, uh, other similar wars. When it comes to Ukraine, it's a, it's, it is a uh, much uh, trickier situation. There is no groundswell of public sentiment to support the war in Ukraine. The American people on the latest poll that I saw, which was early December, a poll of the polling group called Morning Consult, showed the country split exactly down the middle. Should we do more or should we do less for Ukraine? It was 47-47, really quite remarkable, right down the middle. The Republicans much less interested in this war than the Democrats in part because the Democrats are uh, uh, backing the president, the Democratic president, and in part because while we have neoconservatives in both the Republican and the Democratic side, the neoconservatives have taken over the Democratic Party much more than the Republican Party because Trump was just crazy. Not neoconservative, though, just a little nuts. Uh, and, and unstable, but not a neocon. It's, it's actually, he's a very dangerous uh, personality and a very dangerous psychology, uh, really, uh, um, in my view, a clinical case that's quite, seri quite serious and why we had an attempted insurrection. But uh, he didn't launch any wars. He's the only one in our modern history that didn't launch wars. Everyone else made wars. I'm sorry? And no regime change. And no regime change. Yeah, and no regime change. No, he was, he, he liked the guy in North Korea. It's really interesting. Weird. So, so all of this is to say that when you look at the Ukraine issue, the country's Absolutely, this is not driven from below. This is driven from above. And that's partly why we could do something different if there were a different kind of leadership. Biden is not cornered in this. He's choosing this. It's interesting, pay attention to Victoria Newland. She was the Assistant Secretary of State for European and Eurasian Affairs in the Maidan. She flew repeatedly to Kiev to help orchestrate the Maidan. Now she is the Under Secretary of State for uh, political affairs. It's the same mission that's gone on now for the past eight years.
So this is the team that wants that on the Ukrainian side. It's not driven from below. I thought when we voted the first huge amount for Ukraine, 60 billion the first time, 40, 60, I don't remember, it went fast. I said, that's the last one of those that we'll vote for because the American people don't want that, but it's not right. So I'm often very wrong. Uh, we're about to vote another 40 billion, but not debated at all. There will be no debate on it at all because it will be a line item in an omnibus bill that will be voted at the end of the month. And the only debate will be, do we close government or not close government? And since the government will remain open, the 40 billion will go to Ukraine. There will have been not one hour of debate on this in the United States for $40 billion. That's how big we are, by the way, how wasteful, how potentially destructive, how careless. Because we wasted $7 trillion in Iraq and Syria. If you add up all of these uh, disastrous wars and it has weakened our society, but and it added a lot of debt. So it has its consequences, but the American, America's a large economy and it can make a lot of stupid choices for a long, long, long time. And so this 40 billion will go, but now I'm going to predict not another one will go because sometime there's going to have to be a vote on this issue. And if there's ever a vote on this issue, it will not be supported by the American people, actually. Uh, they don't want to keep throwing tens of billions of dollars, even though it's a big economy. They don't actually want that. So this is the the little bit of the domestic side. The anti-China stuff, I don't see that turning off. The only way to turn that off is for Europe to say clearly, don't get us into a war. To say that to the U.S., could someone in Europe say that clearly to the United States? The answer seems to be no. But if, because Brussels doesn't want to have any foreign policy other than what the U.S. wants right now. And Schultz doesn't want to have any foreign policy independent. And the, and the Greens are more militaristic than, than the neocons. <laughs> I've never... Mrs. Baerbach is absolutely the most militaristic senior official in the West. It's amazing to me. And by the way, so destructive of the German economy. I can't even imagine, but maybe that's the Greens idea. They always wanted deindustrialization. They're going to get it. I don't, I don't understand it, but that is, for me, the strange question of German politics is this is completely against Germany's interests.